All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Air Force Reserve Command's Facebook Live event, um, asking questions and answering questions about COVID-19. Uh, please join me in welcoming our commander, Lieutenant General Rich Scalia. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Rich Scobie here. Uh, welcome to all the heroes of the Air Force Reserve and your families. Um, earlier this week, uh, the Command Chief and I, Chief White, we released a video talking a little bit about some of the things that are going on with the COVID-19 response from the Reserve Command. What we're really concerned about is we uh, answer any questions you have. So what I wanted to do was go over a little bit of my commander's intent that I've been getting out, but also to go over uh, some of the questions that you have. So you can't see it in the room right now, but I have all our experts from across the field that are gonna be able to help answer the questions. And if they're uh, in the particular ones that are in my lane to answer, I'm absolutely gonna get after those. If they're uh, questions that are specific, we have ARPC on the line that's gonna be answering your questions. We have A1 that's here in the room and on the line to help answer your questions, and then I have experts in the room as well. So if you ask something that I don't, uh, I'm not the expert on, I'm gonna bring the expert up to get you that answer, and we'll do that. But what I wanted to make sure is everybody understood what our, our lines of effort are gonna be, and in particular, it's our commander's intent. And so what, uh, what the command chief and I have set out is uh, five things, and the first thing is to take care of our reserve citizen airmen and their families. That is the ultimate responsibility that we have. And we're empowering our commanders at every level uh, to make sure that they can do that. We also have ensure that we have information flow up and down the chain. So if you have questions out there uh, that are uh, affecting you and your family or your organization, we need to make sure that we know those and what's going on. And then what I have to be able to do, both at the headquarters here at Air Force Reserve Command and up north in the um, in RE, the Pentagon, is to make sure that we uh, preserve decision space for our local commanders. Nobody knows what's going on at where the decisions need to be made, what I call the point of the decision, better than local commanders and their subordinate commanders. So what we want to do is get out as much policy as we can, get out as much help as we can, and make sure that they can make those decisions uh, that are relevant for you and your families. And then we've got to be able to continue to execute our, our mission essential operations, not only that, but our wartime tasks as well. So we've got to make sure that we can do all of those things. We have to fight our way through this. Uh, all the things we have to do, social distancing, teleworking, all those things are going to be difficult. But we're off to a good start right now, and I expect that to continue. And then uh, the number five thing is preserving the force and taking care of Americans. That is our ultimate responsibility. Not only do we have to provide for the defense, but when things get bad in America, we're the ones that are going to step up to the plate and help along with our other reserve component, lead the Air National Guard. So I'm telling you, this is going to put our reserve to the test, and uh, there's no doubt that we're going to come out of this as a stronger team. And uh, I, I could not have picked a better team to go through this than what we have with you right now. Um, what I need to make sure is everybody out there, uh, as we uh, sequester ourselves off and we're doing those things, I need to make sure that everybody has a virtual wingman that they can call when they need to. Someone to mitigate uh, that loneliness of isolation that we have, our social distancing, and also um, the feelings of, uh, of what is this going to happen and what is, what is this going to turn into as we go forward. We have a lot of helping agencies. No organization is better equipped than we are. So when I talk about our full-time force that is there and we're working through this along with our part-time force, which is fully 75% of who we are, I want to make sure that everybody understands they're connected. You are always going to be part of mine and Chief White's family. And we want to make sure that, we, uh, that you feel that uh, connection. And if you feel disconnected, get with us and we'll make sure that we get the right first sergeant, helping agency, whoever it is that we need to get in your corner, back in your corner. So speaking of wingmen, virtual and otherwise, I'm joined today, like I said, with a panel of experts. I've got A1 here, I've got the SG here, I've got FM here, the A3 and A6, along with the folks that are on the line to help respond to any of the COVID-19 questions that you have. Um, we also have uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dees, who is, as I say, the world-renowned public health officer. And she says that uh, empower the fight, disable the disease, and that's what we're gonna do. So finally, what I want to make sure is that all the policies that we have out there uh, make sense to what you're uh, seeing in, in your local communities as well. And I'll tell you whether or not I'm ready, let's open it up for some questions. All right, sir, first question. Will Air Force Reserve Command cancel scheduled UTAs and events? 
So what we're trying to do is uh, we're canceling every event where we're going to get people together in, in mass numbers um, across the board. What I will say for UTAs, though, is it, we are leaving it to local commander's uh, discretion. So it depends on what the environment, both in the community and within uh, the wings, if, if they're meeting right now, it will be dependent on what that environment is, on what we're going to do uh, with UTAs. We're trying to be creative, allowing people to telecommute if that's uh, necessary, even on UTAs, and do those kind of things in order to get the job done. But I tell you, we've got to prioritize uh, taking care of our airmen and their families, but it's also, like I said, it's our mission essential task and also our war wartime capability we have to preserve. So all those things will, will come together, and your local commanders are going to make those decisions, so that's where you'll get the information on that. All right, so you kind of hit on teleworking, but if my organization directs or allows telework, can I telework from outside my location commuting area? Absolutely. So um, what we need to do is get work done, and we'll figure out the best ways to do it. Uh, our A6 has done a great job of setting us up for success before this happened, and while this is going on, both in the headquarters Air Force, but in particular in the Air Force Reserve Command, we've set ourselves up for the ability to um, dial in, whether it's uh, doing um, uh, virtual meetings, it can be through Jabber, it can be through Desktop Anywhere, or any of the other capabilities that we have in order to get uh, people the ability to telework. But that is the main thing we need to make sure that we're doing is um, preserving the health of our force. And so the more telework that we can do, the better. Okay, sir. If I'm TDY or participating in an exercise and travel to a restricted area, i.e. Korea, um, Italy, will I be kept on orders um, for the quarantine uh, once I've returned to the United States? Okay, he, the answer is yes, but it's a little more complex than that, and I want to make sure that it's clear. What I really worry about, especially in our part-time force, is folks that have already made, um, uh, worked out agreements with their civilian employers so that they can come in to work. To the max extent possible, what we're going to do is if we told somebody they're going to come in on orders, we're going to keep them on orders for whatever we need to. we got plenty of work here at the headquarters if anybody's missing out on a place to work. But what we also want to do is if somebody is on an order and they've traveled through a level two or level three country and we have to quarantine them or self-quarantine them, what we want to make sure is uh, we're not going to break that order. So if there's an additional 14 days of quarantine that's required based on the travel, they're going to do that in whatever status they were in. So if they were in MPA status, we'll keep it in MPA status. If they were in RPA status working with the Air Force Reserve Command, we'll keep it in RPA status. But if we are putting the burden on our people to do those things, we're going to make sure they're under orders while they do it. So, sir, if they're quarantined, what happens if they actually uh, contract COVID-19? Uh, is there a line of duty determination that would go along with that uh, if they're on orders already? Absolutely. Just like we would do with any other um, uh, thing that happened to our airmen, there'll be a line of duty determination. And so we'll work our way through that. Obviously, uh, COVID-19, it, it is a bad uh, disease. There's a, and, and you will be under the weather for an extended period of time. Fortunately for us, uh, the, m almost everybody in the Air Force Reserve is young, healthy, and has access to good uh, medical care. And the, and, the, and the survival rate for the disease is incredibly high if you have those things going in your favor. So what I would expect is you know, people will, will um, if they contract the disease, it will, um, they'll, they'll get well, and then we'll get, carry on business like we always would. But if there's any kind of um, lingering effects or anything else that people are concerned about, our uh, line of duty uh, determinations will work just like they did would for anything else, and we'll make sure that our airmen are taken care of. All right, sir. Um, can you just re-emphasize what we're going to do as a command to keep our citizen airmen healthy and safe from exposure when they do have to do those operations? So, well, two things. First of all, what we want to do is we've got to prioritize in our operations. We've got to make sure that we're prioritizing our wartime mission. So we're going to get after that. Whatever it takes in order to do that, and then the repercussions that follow based on having to have people on orders, either preventative to have them on orders so that we maintain the capability, or after they're finished with the operation, we have to keep them on quarantine orders. We're going to make sure we do that. The second piece is, is for the normal day-to-day -day operations of our organization, what we're trying to do is follow all the CDC guidance and our DOD guidance on how we're going to, to, to maintain social distancing and then also isolating ourselves from contact. So if you can see the rest of this room, everybody in here is sitting uh, six feet apart. And so that is, uh, that is the first thing. We're going to absolutely set the example for how we do things. The other thing is there are 10, 
maybe 12 people in the room. But what we're trying to do is keep the number of people in any meeting down to a minimum. So in our organization here at the headquarters, what we're doing is uh, when we have to have the, the crisis action team stood up in meetings, we'll have rooms around the headquarters where we have individuals located. So not more than 10 people are in any one room as we are conducting meetings. And then we allow people to call in or whatever they need to do. The other thing we've done is move all of our meetings that we can from the classified side to the nipper side, the unclassified side, so that we can call in on normal uh, phone lines and things like that to get the maximum number of people the information they need. And then lastly, what we're ensuring is we isolate people with like functions. For instance, um, the command chief is teleworking today. He's online and he'll answer any of your questions that you have. So if you have anything for the command chief, make sure you address him directly. Also, General Flournoy. General Flournoy is telecommuting today. So what we're trying to do is separate uh, the deputy commander from the commander so that if one of us gets sick, the other one can fill in uh, those gaps. So General Flournoy, Flournoy and I are trying to separate our work schedule as much as possible. Okay. Uh, I'd just like to remind our Facebook audience out there to send those questions in. Uh, General Scobie is uh, willing and, and wants those questions to, uh, from his heroes out there in the field. So uh, get them into us. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Sir, this is from a lieutenant out at Travis. He says, uh, many of us reservists have lost employment income uh, starting this week. Uh, my wing just told us we will not uh, meet for the upcoming UTA, and now we have lost another source of income for this month. I understand we will make up our UTA, but that extra check is now delayed. Just when we all got hit with a reduced, sometimes nothing, take-home paycheck. Um, would it be possible uh, to still give airmen a helping hand in their monthly expenses in this layoff condition, or should we just say, be resilient? Well, you know, part of resiliency is, is making sure that the command does what it needs to take care of our airmen. And there's two pieces to this. The first is, if we have, um, if we've uh, made sure that airmen are ready to come into work for the things that we need to do, we're going to uh, eat those bills because we're going to have to be able to pay our airmen as, we've, as, as we're trying to conduct our business. I talked about that at the beginning as, as we come in. If an airman has, made, um, uh, has, has worked with their civilian employer to take time off to be in the reserve, we're going to bring them in and pay those bills uh, to the max uh, possible. On the, um, for the UTA piece, what the commanders are looking at two things. How can they, um, this is the second part of it, how are they going to be able to get the jobs done that they need to? If some of the things can be done through uh, telework, they're going to allow that telework. If some people need to come in in order to do that, they're going to come in in order to do that. We've got to protect the force, so we're trying to isolate as much contact as we can uh, with each other. But the command will look at uh, what are the what is our ability to uh, keep UTAs and those UTA paychecks, because I absolutely understand that that additional income every month is something that our airmen uh, expect and have been planning on, but we're going to keep that going as much as possible. Our plan, through most of the commanders, and every organization is going to be different, is to be able to make that up, but we'll do it in a way that uh, happens as quickly as possible through either super UTAs or putting additional UTAs uh, uh, within our, our normal month plan. And why we need to do that is we're going to take a hit in some of our readiness because of this, but we absolutely have to make sure that, we, that our readiness doesn't continue to stay down. And the only way to do that is to repurpose those days that we were going to use for the UTA and put them in there where we can actually get work done. So in order to make sure that the checks flow in an orderly manner, we'll take a look at what the best way to do that is, but we absolutely have the best interests of our airmen in mind. Sir, has there any, been any conversation about activating medical reserve units at this point to help out with the COVID um, relief efforts? Yeah, uh, so really for our medical units, um, what we have to do is look at what is the ability of our medical units, in particular that part-time force, which is the majority of our medical units, uh, to come in. And they have to be able to balance that with what the needs of their local communities are. So we're taking right now, the A3 is taking a look at all of our medical organizations and what their ability to stand anything up is. We have great capacity in the Guard and Reserve. What is unusual about this is this is, this is an attack on the homeland with the COVID-19. COVID really what we're, and so American people are, uh, and our medical systems are really um, strained right now. So what we have to make sure is we don't add any strain to that by who we are bringing in. So we're looking at what kind of capabilities that we have, 
What can we bring in? And what does our full-time support uh, look like when we do that? And we'll balance that with what the needs of the local communities are, and we'll make sure we take a measured approach. The Chief of Staff of the Air Force and the Secretary of the Air Force both asked myself and General Rice as the Director of the Air National Guard and the Commander of the Air Force Reserve Command, what is our ability to help in this situation? And we, are, we will look at that because we have great ASTS and MEG group organizations out there that can absolutely lend a hand when needed. This is a very specific question from, from one of your airmen out in the field. It says, I'm an airman on orders at a school. I'm being sent home. If I find out another student tested positive, will my orders continue while in quarantine? So what we have to do is make sure that we are following the guidance. So the, the one thing uh, to ensure is the contact of a contact is not a contact. But if there is somebody that you are in direct contact with that, does, uh, um, that has conducted the coronavirus, then the answer is yes. Uh, you will be, uh, you'll be under quarantine. Uh, the DOD guidance will apply to you and you'll continue to be on orders during that. The other thing too is for our students, uh, that we've been uh, placing on orders. What we'll have to see is if they're a part-time person that can go back to the civilian job and that they can take that break in orders and we'll get them to school when we can, that's great. But if not, we're going to keep them on orders. The same with seasoning training in order to do that. We'll get that training done to the best of our ability, but we cannot break that trust with our airmen and their families. And I'll call a phone a friend, uh, Colonel Dees. Um, does that, uh, that check with you? Yes, My answer? Great. So from our world-renowned uh, doctor, health organization doctor um, for public health, that checks. All right, sir. As you know, the, the, the chief and the secretary have said readiness, we're going to be ready for this. Uh, it's probably slowed down the pipeline of getting uh, airmen overseas to, to do, um, you know, uh, go through and get replacements. So this was a uh, person asking, he's deployed. Um, will he redeploy home without a replacement on site and will his orders be extended in order to get him back home on time? So, uh, well, you can't have both. He's either going to get back home on time or we're going to extend his orders. Um, we are looking through that right now. It is, I would say, be prepared. Be prepared for what the nation is going to need. So, uh, can a reservist leave without a replacement that is already uh, downrange? The answer is yes, that can happen. It may not be in the best interests of our country. So what we're doing is we're working with our FTC, uh, Jill Skaysbrick and her team, is working to make sure that we are extending any new orders that need to be extended, that we're communicating with those airmen. And I've talked to all of your commanders out there to make sure each, by individual, they know who's at risk for having to stay longer downrange, who will be able to come home, and, uh, and what that's going to look like. I can tell you, as the commander of the Air Force Reserve Command and as an airman, the, my priority is making sure that we preserve that combat capability. And if there's some kind of extension that needs to be done because of this crisis that we're in, I'm behind what the Air Force needs and the Department of Defense. Um, and if, what I want to do is I don't want to leave the active component, the one that's holding the bag. What we need to do is make sure that we step up to the plate too. So it's going to be tough because we're going to have to look at every single airman, what their situation is based on their employer and their family and what those needs are and what the needs of the Department of Defense are for, for the ability to have airmen downrange. And we'll weigh all those things and that will determine who we move and who we don't move and what the ability to take care of that business is. Okay, sir. This is kind of a follow-up to readiness. We're talking about uh, SDP program for airmen. Uh, do we keep those airmen uh, still at the unit when training isn't available or can we reschedule STP for a further point uh, down the line in this in the fiscal year? I'd say um, the answer is both of those things. So if we have an airman that cannot get training uh, to the level that we need and they have the ability to reschedule based on what their civilian employer can allow, then um, I, I leave that completely up to the, the local commanders to determine how they want that to flesh out. Can the command authorize telework or telecommute to complete RMP or AT for this fiscal year? I'm going to have to phone a friend on that. So from, uh, from a either A1 or RAP perspective, what is our answer on that? Good. Come on up and you can, you can be on Facebook like me. <laughs> All right, sir. And if we have to get an answer later, we can. This is Lieutenant Colonel Sobieski from Africa Day One. The, uh, the question was, can commands authorize telework or telecommute to complete readiness management periods or annual training? 
and, and absolutely, uh, it's up to the individual commander to work with those individual reservists to arrange telecommuting. There are specific requirements and agreements that have to be accomplished, uh, but in order to, uh, to complete uh, your annual training or any other status by telecommute status, it, it is up to the individual unit commander in conjunction with the reservists. That's a good answer. Thanks. So still with that pay and benefits, um, will the Air Force Aid Society be open to be open and available to provide resources, funds to airmen who have lost employment during this time frame? So the answer is, in the, with the Air Force Aid Society, it, it is um, it's determined upon uh, the rules which they set forward for reservists, which I believe there's a certain number of days you have to be on orders in order to do that. I don't know if anybody here has information on the Air Force Aid Society. I can tell you. Bill. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Um, at this time, we've uh, engaged with the Air Force Aid Society. Um, we have not received, because it's Air Force Aid Society is an independent function, and they go by their own rule set. And we've pushed out. Um, we've also pushed out a lot of financial well-being uh, information out to, the, out to your local Airman Family Readiness Centers. Uh, and you should be seeing that as well. But at this time, we've engaged Air Force Aid Society, but we have not received the official word on their response to COVID-19. Great. Thanks, Bill. And I do know that, um, especially for our part-time um, reservists out there, it is really going to be tough based on, uh, especially if you're in the service industry, there's going to be a lot of folks that are um, going to be underemployed through this thing. And, and what I will say is um, we've been struggling with our full-time manning in the Air Force Reserve Command. So we have a lot of full-time jobs that are available as uh, AGRs, as technicians, and as straight civilians. So if, for anybody that is fearful of being underemployed in the long term because of this uh, crisis, make sure you're getting out to our websites and, uh, and take a look at those. I would love the opportunity to be able to, especially if somebody is stressed, to relieve that stress by bringing you on in our full-time statuses. We still go through the, the same hiring processes as we did before, but there's all kinds of opportunities in ops, maintenance, and then you run, it runs the gambit of all the things we're doing. And as the Reserve Command, we were adding 500 uh, full-time jobs over the next uh, two years to our end strength. Those are all AGRs that, that we're adding. So we'll be, uh, there'll be some potential jobs out there for folks as we go forward. So sir, it sounds like you have a lot of jobs. Um, for, the, for your employees now, uh, somebody's asking, will pay be affected for reservists and Air Force Reserve Command civilians? No, we don't, we don't anticipate any disruption in pay. The, uh, you know, and that's one of the things for our part-time employees, that is one of the things that we have really struggled with in the past and we're working hard to make sure that we're, you know, there, many of us have been not paid on time as a part-time employee. We're working on getting that a whole lot better, but I can tell you from the full-time uh, perspective, there's going to be no interruption to uh, pay and benefits. So as we know, many, many bases uh, have maybe closed down their schools, daycares, uh, you know, state mandates to do that. Um, what, what's the guidance that you would give or, or suggestions you would give to arts and full-time civilians who no longer have that school or daycare open and they're still required to come to work? Yeah, this, this is what I, what I would say is um, each one of you needs to be working uh, with your local commanders, um, especially down at the uh, squadron command level to determine what your ability uh, to do your job is going to be. When you're setting priorities, you've got to prioritize your family piece. And regardless of having um, schools that are out and daycare that you, and, and trying to isolate your family from being exposed uh, to this, that has got to be the primary thing. If you have a, a family care plan that you can enact that allows you to continue to do your work, if you're required to be at work, that's great. But if somebody has the ability to come into work because that's a requirement, great, we'll let them do that. And somebody that doesn't have the, the ability, I implore all commanders to make sure that they are taking care of each individual as we get through this crisis. Because some folks, especially our single parents out there, don't have as much flexibility. And what we need to make sure is that we're meeting their needs and their family's needs as well. And we are flexible as we try to get through this problem. And so if you have a problem, our first sergeants, our chiefs, our commanders, all those people are going to help you come up with a plan that's going to be best for you and your family. And, and I would say you've got to prioritize that. 
got to prioritize that. Can you emphasize or, or discuss um, your thoughts on the need for absolute isolation? Well, I don't think anybody is going to get absolute isolation. You know, if you look at what's happening in California, and New York, and now even in Washington, D.C., um, isolation is really important. I, you know, I, I'd say one of the things that is ironic to me is um, my kids are doing a great job. Uh, I have kids in, in Arizona, here in, in, uh, in, the, in middle Georgia, and also in California. They are doing a better job of isolating than my mom is. Um, she is still going out to the store and things like that, and I am on her every day to, to isolate it because she's in that at-risk population that's above 70. So what we really need to do is uh, we need to do the best that we can. So if you, if you look at how the disease spread, it is from, it is from you know, individual, one spreading it to another, whether it's through surfaces get contaminated or um, uh, personal contact. So social distancing is very important if you do have to go out. If you can isolate yourself and you don't have to go out, that is going to be the best thing for you. The more you can isolate yourself, the, the less you can have contact with whatever that outside world is. And the more you use your phone a friend because you need a virtual wingman, uh, the better off you're going to be. We'll never be able to isolate completely. It is not in this command, not with the business that we have to do, but it is limiting our exposure. And uh, I'll look to Colonel Dees to see if that's a good answer. I got a thumbs up from the SG, which doesn't happen very often, so I'll take that. So the next two questions, we'll kind of talk about waivers in, in the waiver process. Uh, for those that had AT and IDT orders canceled, uh, they may be facing a bad year. Will there be a waiver or something to ensure a good year of service for our, our reserve citizen airmen out there? Yeah. Um, our first thing is we are going to do no harm to our airmen. So come on up. We'll, I'll let A1 give you the definitive answer. It's Lieutenant Colonel Sobieski again. So for our, in, for our uh, traditional reservists, there is this 16 uh, quarter or 16 uh, points per quarter limitation that the AFRIC NAF commanders have waiver authority for. So the individual units can can work with uh, as rescheduling is needed to try and make sure that assuming that we're through this and that we're participating in the fourth quarter or even hopefully in the third quarter that we can maximize participation and get waivers that were needed for the 16 point limit. With regard to a bad year, that is legisl that's law. So in order to have 50 points to get a satisfactory year is law. So as this unfolds, you know, there might be the potential that we get legislative relief from Congress, but we'll have to work and maximize our abilities to participate now, whether that's through telecommuting, uh, like we discussed earlier, through, uh, for any types of participation. We encourage people to, to maximize any uh, uh, education that, that would grant ECI point credit and things like that. So each unit needs to be working through those with the individual reservists, looking at ready, uh, recruiting and retention years and maximizing what's available now. And as, the, as COVID-19 unfolds, we will work with leadership to, uh, to see where we can help as much as possible. I'll tell you this, as far as laws come and things like that, we're going to be focused on making sure we take care of our airmen. Uh, COVID-19 is not your fault. So what we're going to do is we'll work with our, uh, our uh, elected officials to make sure we get legislation that's going to help you. If not, and in the meantime, I can tell you this, uh, we'll work with you in, in what we need to do uh, down to the individuals. And, and there's so few people will probably affect it because a normal reservist works between six and eight days a month on average. So most of us will have no problem meeting the points requirement, but if you are concerned about that, uh, continue to flight follow it, and if you're getting close to that, uh, your R&R &R year, make sure that you reach out to our uh, A1 communities, your personnelists, to see where you are and work with your commanders to uh, see if you can work around that. And I tell you, the, um, if I find out somebody uh, misses a good year because of this, uh, this disease, it, I'm going to be really unhappy about it. So if it, you know, I'm, I'm talking to if you're a chief, if you're a commander, if you're an individual out there that's concerned about that, send an email to timothy.white at us.af.mil and I'll put the command chief on this. There you go. And he'll let me know. The second waiver question is, is, is there a waiver in the works for air crew currency and evaluation requirements? That's a good question. I'm going to turn it over to A3 to answer that. Uh, General Berger, uh, the Africa A3, uh, 
first off, uh, our goal is to maintain readiness and, and not need currency uh, any waivers at this time. We understand as we've pulled our units across the force, we're still flying and we're still generating combat capability and power for this nation. I feel very confident in our wing commanders and our group commanders' ability to fight through the challenges presented by this, uh, And but we're sustaining right now flight operations. There are pockets and challenges within this, and I think it's we'll see that uh, evolve over time. So in the short term, we haven't authorized any waivers, but we are prepared to so support the commanders in the field with waivers when appropriate. Will reenlistments be possible during this time with limited staff available to process paperwork? Um, and if somebody does end up uh, where they're reenlistment, they don't reenlist, uh, will they be automatically extended um, through this process? What are we going to do? <laughs> yes, everyone needs to be working with their career assistance advisors. There's administrative extensions to an enlistment that could be taken care of if that's absolutely necessary uh, to avoid anyone's enlistment expiring. Uh, but uh, in addition to the administrative extensions, there's also uh, exceptions to policy. That's uh, definitely uh, not as restrictive in, as law. So please make sure you're communicating with your career assistance advisors, your force support units, and we'll get you taken care of. Good answer. Sir, can you address the issue of PCS and assignments that are on hold currently? Yeah, PCS uh, is going to be, a, we're going to have to work our way through this. Right now, um, for our command, it is the first general officer in your chain of command has the authority to make sure those things are moving. I tell you, this is the way we're looking at it. We're looking at uh, hardships on families and what that's going to be. If, if, if you're going to break a lease or incur costs um, that are exorbitant because something is, is getting um, messed up with your move, we're, we're going to get after that. All the NAV commanders are absolutely on board. ARPC understands uh, what their responsibility is. And then also uh, for the headquarters here, General Florinari, and then anybody in RE up at, uh, on the half staff at the Pentagon, it's General Hegbet. So these, um, all these generals completely understand uh, what their objectives are. And that is, first of all, to take care of our airmen and families. Uh, we kind of hit on this earlier. Um, do you see foresee delays in paperwork routed up to AFRC uh, due to the virus coming from the wings, uh, waivers, or, or just paperwork in general? So I would actually say that we're seeing a little bit of an increase in our ability to process paperwork, uh, mostly because of the things that I have to sign. I'm not traveling, and, and so I sit at my computer isolated, looking out the window, wishing I wasn't at work. But um, the, actually, I love work. But really what it is, is uh, uh, with the telecommuting and everything else we're doing, we're seeing pretty good processing of, of, of all the paperwork we have to do. So if there's a hitch in that, we'll make sure that we get after it. But with the A6's help, everything that's going on in A1, plus the commanders and staffs, because we're isolated, it gives us the ability to sit down and get more of that done. So I've actually seen an increase in our ability to get paperwork done. So sir, we talked about uh, that reservist maybe being delayed coming home. Uh, this question says is if we're currently deployed and discover family members infected with COVID-19, are we able to use the Red Cross for emergency leave or must we remain in place? What if the family member's condition is critical? So, you know, the, I will tell you that obviously the commanders in the field are going to be able to make those uh, judgment calls. But when, uh, when we have uh, family members that are in distress, it is really imperative that we bring uh, our members home uh, if we have the ability to do that. And, uh, and outside of some military operation that is uh, that's critical, I don't, I don't see anything that would, uh, would keep us from bringing uh, folks home. If it is, uh, and it all depends on what the symptoms are, each, in, each case individual is going to be different, but if you have uh, family members that, that's critical, we're, we're going to get you home. And we'll, we'll do, I'll do whatever is in my power. As soon as I find out, I'll do whatever my, is in my power. I'll work with the commanders downrange, and, uh, and we'll get you going in the right direction. So we're about 40 minutes into this. I'll let everybody know out there in Facebook land. Keep those questions coming to General Scobie. Uh, I can tell by the look on his face he's really enjoying this at this point. So uh, we'll just continue to keep rolling on. So uh, this one's from the Air Force Magazine up at uh, Fort Meade, Maryland. Uh, how will the California Shelter-in-Place order impact reservists in the state with respect to TDYs, deployments, training, etc.? So in the, if, if, it is, uh, if it's mission critical things, those are uh, what are exempted. So some things in California will be exempted from a military perspective. 
but by and large, and, and we're not just doing this in California, but it's across the board, uh, shelter in place and, and trying to isolate ourselves as much as possible is good business practice for what we're doing in the reserve. So everybody that has the ability to telework, uh, they should be asking themselves, why can't I telework instead of why should I telework? So why can't I? And then uh, because we have the connectivity that we have with our own A6 that's given us the ability to do that, to telework it, it pretty robustly. So that's what we should be uh, focused on. Uh, California is the same thing. So we, we've been in contact with all of our bases there and the number of air forces there. And we have a good idea of, of what that's going to look like and that we'll be able to fight our way through this, uh, even in isolation. All right, sir, this, this person must have read your uh, your priorities because he has a reform organization as one of your priorities. Yeah. Uh, he says, as this virus affects or cancels training, is there a team evaluating overall methods of training in the future? For example, more distance learning? That is, uh, you know, the reservists never cease to amaze me at uh, how smart you are. Um, that's exactly what we're looking at. This has really been a forcing function uh, for us to look at how we would do um, more distance learning, uh, which really fits in well uh, with what my wife calls a tyranny of distance because our families are so spread out. How do we uh, go about uh, making sure that we educate our folks and get as much work done even though we're, uh, we're separated? So what this is doing is, is we're taking a look at everything we're doing from uh, our, our professional development center uh, to uh, how our coursework is done in all the courses. Now I will say there's a lot of things we like to do in person because it, uh, it builds a spirit as core and also builds a network of people that you can count on. So what I want to do is ensure that we do both. We need to bring people together so you have that network of people that you can count on when you need to. Uh, a friend in A1, a friend in FM, a friend in SG, whatever you need uh, to make sure that you understand uh, you have a person you can call and you have that personal rapport with so that when we come into a situation like this, you can clear up a lot of things that are going wrong with one phone call. But what I also want to do is make sure that we have robust capability to push information out to our airmen so that they can get the education they need when we're isolated. So we're doing both. So I think you've already answered this, but we're still going to ask you. Uh, will distance learning classes be canceled? So distance learning <laughs> classes are, are, are going on. As a matter of fact, I'm loving some distance learning classes right now. So what we need to do is maximize those uh, to the greatest extent possible. Yeah. Can you address readiness issues, uh, PT, PHA, dental, immunization, etc.? And what's AFRC's guidance for those members who are going to be read in the next couple of months due to COVID-19? I'm going to have A1 come up and, and talk through that stuff, but in general, uh, come on up Bill, in general I would say we're waving what we can wave, we're pushing off what we can push off, there's great guidance out there, make sure that you're looking at our, um, at, at the, uh, at the AFRIC website, it's AFRIC at AF.mil, and, uh, and take a look at that because it will really give you, um, uh, information on the things that we are doing. The AFRIC website, I might have given you the wrong address, but the AFRIC website is where you need to go. We have a, some links on there that you can you can link on to and it's going to give you the information you need on those things, but they'll let you talk to it. Just to kind of address uh, the readiness issues, I mean, one thing I'll address in particular is the fitness assessments. The Air Force has put a pause on fitness assessments until June, so everybody uh, will be mark marked forward till June, and we'll reassess at that point in time. As far as the other readiness items, just like General Scobie mentioned, um, it's it, we'll probably see the Air Force lean in that direction as well as far as readiness uh, indicators are concerned. But for right now, the only one that's in place right now from the Air Force in Africa is the the uh, fitness assessment being uh, rescheduled till June. Um, the other ones will be a commander's directive until it's an Air Force directive and an Africa directive. So what I can tell you is, is uh, as your commander, this is what I care about, is that if, if, if we have the ability to get you out the door in short order, that's all I care about. If, there, if you're red for dental, you're red for uh, physical, you're red for fitness or something like that, we can clean that up in a minute. What I'm really worried about is overall, overall are my airmen ready enough uh, to be able to do their wartime mission and we'll clean up all that IMR stuff at, at the point of need. All right, sir. In your opening comments, you talked about having that virtual friend that you can reach out to anywhere. So uh, Tom uh, Pemberton wants to know, uh, boss, are you and the family doing all right? So so how do you, let's go into resiliency, how are you staying resilient through this and, 
And what's kind of the, your word to our citizen airmen to continue to be? Re- oh my goodness! You know the uh, uh, for those you, you guys spent, see me spend a lot of time with uh, Mrs. Scobie, uh, Janice, my wife. Um, she's the resilient person in my family. Uh, so right now, uh, I get no texts or anything from my kids. They go directly to her asking for advice because um, she is prepared uh, for all these things going on. Uh, our pantry is full. <laughs> I suggest you go out and fill yours too. But if you're running low on food, you can come to my house because we have enough to feed the command. Okay. But really, um, um, that's, uh, that's what it's been. And so uh, every morning, uh, and every evening we sit down together and we go over our plan for what are we doing? We're worried about our aging parents. We're worried about our kids who are taking better care of themselves than we are. But we're about that and so we set up those plans. What happens if we lose connectivity? What happens if somebody gets sick in the family and how are we going to deal with it? Um, that those are the things that we go through every day. And so it's building a family plan uh, and it's based around resiliency and who is going to do what uh, if we need it. The other thing too is um, your command chief and I, we talk every day about the things that are going on. So he is uh, isolated up in, in DC right now and I'm down here uh, by design. So normally we travel everywhere together, but what we really wanted to do is make sure that we had a little bit of separation between us so that we could um, we could make it through this uh, crisis. So um, so I'm making sure that he's okay. He not, not only is he my real wingman, but he's also my virtual wingman. But between the, the solid piece of the family that I have and the solid piece uh, with the folks that I, that I count on at, every day, like the command chief and General Flournoy and General Hegda, that we are all synced together. What I would say is, um, you know, I, I, I'm very fortunate for being able to have that. But for all of our airmen out there, not everybody has uh, somebody that's in, uh, that, that they're being isolated with that has that ability or uh, a robust uh, virtual wingman. Uh, this, is what I'm, this is what I implore you to do, is stay connected. Stay connected with us. What I, what, uh, what I can't have is people that are in our organization, and I don't care what status you're in, you're always part of my family. And what you need to realize is we have so many uh, resources available in the Air Force Reserve Command that our elected officials have given us that we can stay connected. Uh, the command chief and I, we're putting full-time first sergeants in our organization. We're putting full-time command chiefs in our big organizations. We put over 44 uh, new medical folks in our organizations to take care of the business of that. We have the resources and we're continuing to get them out there. But if you feel disconnected, reach out. Talk to your first sergeants. Talk to your section chiefs, talk to your chiefs, talk to your commanders, whoever it is. And again, if you run out of people to talk to, there's two Scobies in the global, there's a bunch of whites, but it's timothy.white6 at (laughs) us.af.mil. That's the one you want. Send them an email. And even if if you're just bored, send them an email anyway. And uh, it's the more the better. But really what it is, is reach out to the people who can help you be connected. And uh, I want to make sure you all understand that. So, sir, before we get to your last question for this uh, period, I just want to let everybody know out there on Facebook, if you still have questions, send them in. Uh, The staff here at the headquarters will make sure that you get an answer. Uh, We'll route that uh, to the appropriate person, or we'll get it to General Scobie directly, and we'll get an answer to that. So, uh, with that, sir, your your last question is, what do you perceive as the most disturbing effect that this will have on commands? Wow. The the problem that this is going to have on our command is it's straining resources. Um, Right now, uh, this is going to be about a $3 trillion hit to our economy and to the United States. Um, That is a significant amount of money. Our elected officials are going to have a tough time uh, working their way through this. I I applaud uh, what our government has done in order to get help to Americans and how they're handling uh, this situation. Uh, Your Air Force is doing an incredible job. I could not imagine a better team than we have in our our command chief, in our chief of staff of the Air Force, and in the secretary of the Air Force. And I'll tell you, I've spent the last um, three days in a row, and and twice a week I spend with the other MAGCOM commanders. There are ten major commands uh, in our Air Force, and those ten commanders have um, your best interests in mind. Not only that, but the protection of our American citizens as well. So I would say um, what I worry about is 
what is the new normal going to look like for us? What are we going to be able to do in the Department of Defense? Will we continue to be able to be uh, the global force that takes care of the people that can't take care of themselves? I think that's an incredible role that the United States plays. It's something we need to continue to do. Right now, I'm focused on us. I'm focused on America, and I'm focused on Americans. And really important to me, I'm focused on our reservists, making sure that they're taken care of. Uh, but in the future, we're going to have to open that scope up quite a bit and see, uh, and see what this is going to look like for the world. A pandemic, we always knew something like this could happen. But now that we're seeing how it's affecting us, um, we're going to be better prepared as we come out of this on the back end, but it's going to put a strain on all of our resources. This is what I need. I need us to take care of ourselves. I need to make sure everybody out there stays connected with our organization. I need to make sure that you're going out to the websites, and whether it's the CDC, whether it's the Department of Defense, but especially the Air Force Reserve Command. I'm really proud of the work that our, our PA has done in order to make sure that airmen have one place to go. Look at the Chief's Facebook page, look at my Facebook page. They'll point you to the right place to get information. If you're still not getting the information you need, um, I don't care where you are, what status you're in, if you're you know, part-time, TR, IMA, technician, AGR, reach out to your leadership, start asking questions. If you're not getting the answers that you need from them, then it's going to help you and your families. Start going somewhere else to get that information. Go up your chain or go outside your organization to other places that will give you the information. Just don't stop. You need to have information. Be persistent in trying to get it. And until you get to our command and this headquarters, we will answer your questions. So although I may be stopping this Facebook Live right now, what I want to make sure is you have all of the experts at your fingertips. Keep your questions coming in. Keep posting them online. Get them to us. The A1, the SG, the FM will answer your questions and get those done uh, to the utmost of our ability. But you have to know our priority is to take care of you, our airmen, and your families. And I don't care what status you're in. I don't care if you're on orders or not on orders. You're always part of our family. You need to stay connected with us. And I want everybody to be well. Thanks for your time out there, and I appreciate you being here today. Anything else, Sean? No, sir. Not at this point. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate you.